Well, Jason, welcome to my channel. Uh, I was on yours about, I think it was about two weeks ago that we did ours, maybe three weeks ago. Um, I decided to have you on mine as well because also it's important to have, you know, the antithetical viewpoint here. Uh, I just have a few questions for you because you're relatively new in the space, um, sort of, um, because I haven't, I've only been seeing you for about three or four months, maybe even less than that. Uh, so of course we have to start off with the, the classic question of what brought you to carnivore or at the very least the ketogenic space, um, to begin with and how has that actually been for you, the diet and also the space itself? Yeah. So I, I have a unique perspective because I didn't land here out of necessity. Um, right. you know, I kind of, I kind of just found it because I was, I wanted to feel better. And that, that was the, and it wasn't like some big ailment. I was tired of being bloated and lethargic and not feeling good after eating. Even when I cut out processed food, uh, kind of the trigger point was I did the whole 30 diet, which I've done before. It's just like an easy reset, get rid of processed food. I did it for 90 days, lost weight, didn't feel any better. And it was literally like, this is dumb. Like I literally did not cheat one single time, like not even a snack off my kid's plate. And I didn't feel better. And in some instances, I was like, man, I think I even feel worse. Like, how is that possible? So I said, screw it, gained all the weight back. And then finally, my wife had sent me Paul Saladino a couple times. And as much hate as as Paul gets, uh, he's brought a lot of people to at least the starting point. Um, and so I, I started with animal-based. I did animal-based for a little over a year. Felt great, had great results. Uh, and it was finally, I was like, man, I'm, I'm pretty low on carbs. I wonder what would happen if I just cut them out completely. Um, I'd always been worried about like keto flu and all that. I finally just cut them out and I was like, this is better. And that's literally how I ended up on carnivore completely. Um, I, I put myself in the carnivore category because I was pretty low on my, my carbohydrate intake. Uh, and I would go days where I didn't, but yeah, I was fully carnivore starting in November. And honestly, it's just been the difference for me between animal based and carnivore is just a little bit, a little bit more level energy. Uh, the fat adaptation means I can go a little bit longer without eating. And it just helps overall, uh, just in kind of dealing with everyday life. Like you get busy, don't know if you're going to eat. It's easy just to go four, five, six hours, uh, you know, after when I would normally eat when I'm fully carnivore. Animal based, I would have to get a little bit more, you know, I would have to be a little more conscious of what it was I was doing. But yeah, yes, yeah, so that's kind of uh, how I ended. Okay. How I uh, got to it. Yeah. So. Okay, then we're similar in that respect, very similar, because I think I covered in the last one, maybe we didn't, um, that my journey was a lot more lengthy, and it was a lot more you know, tumultuous. The thing about mine was that is similar to yours and congruous with yours is the fact that we both came across Paul Saladino, and we also came across this diet not due to necessity per se. You didn't have any health issues, really. Um, like besides the ones that you just listed that weren't exactly, they're, they're not, they don't reach that level yet of being classified as a health issue, right? I had an extreme health issue, but it wasn't due to diet. So that we're still similar in that respect. I was brought to the carnivore space, not because it cured me or else I'd be cured right now. Right. So, but we also, yeah, we came across Paul Saladino, my experience on the animal based diet. So you said that yours was primarily, you didn't have as stable of energy levels as you do now when you had the carbs in. Mine, I was on it for about a month and my energy levels, it's hard to say what my energy levels were because I wasn't really able to do anything anyway at that time. But what I can say was that it was the only time that I'd ever had heat flashes after I ate, a red face, elevated blood pressure, um, and, and actually starting like starting to sweat for the, after, it was, you know, people call those the meat sweats, but meat sweats. yeah, the irony is that you cut the carbs and they're gone. So, um, but Okay, so, so that was the dietary element of it. Can I ask you, what was your carb content looking like when you were animal-based? Was How many carbs were you eating and where were they coming from? So if you're talking about Paul Saladino, then we're talking about fruit and honey and maple syrup, yep. stuff like that. Fruit how much honey. of it was, um, Okay, so fruit and honey and how many carbs were there? Typically, typically it was right around 50. Like it was pretty low. Um, 
I didn't track super hard. So, you know, there was days I would go up to maybe a hundred if I snacked a little extra on fruit. But when I first started, I was pretty lenient. Um, you, you could almost call it like dirty animal based because right. basically what I did was for my meals. And then I would still have snacks. And if I wanted a beer at the end of the night, I'd have a beer, right? And then I finally kicked that. Um, did almost an entire year of a fairly strict animal based. But for the most part, I was pretty low. Um, that's why I made the decision just to go carnivore because I was really cutting out maybe 50 grams of carbs a day. Right. And I was like, it's not much. Like, let's just see what happens. I'm, I'm curious. And that's, and so that's probably part of why part of me wants to do an experiment, an animal based experiment where I do the same as sad, but with 500 grams of, of carbs from like fruit and honey. You're right. Yeah. Part of me doesn't want to mess with it. Um, but I, I think that would be a better idea of the, which is, you know, what's going to give me a different effect, animal based or carnivore. Because when I was animal based, I was so close to carnivore that it was just like this small transition. Uh, you're braver than most if you undergo that experiment. I said that before with your standard American diet experiment. I couldn't believe it. I don't, I don't know how you did it. And I also was actually pretty surprised at how well you withstood that and how well your body withstood it. I We talked about this in the previous interview as well. I'm pretty sure I, I would I would guarantee that the amount of muscle you have on you definitely helped with that for sure. Um, but so did you have it when you had the carbs in your diet, did you have any addictive proclivities towards those carbs? Um, cause that's one thing that people talk about a lot. Yeah, not really. Um, and that's part of why I, I'm okay with doing these experiments. Uh, a lot of comments I'll get is, man, I could do that. It, it would just lead me down this. I don't have an addictive personality. Um, okay. you know, I, I, I go back to, I, I played college baseball when I got out, I coached college baseball and chewing tobacco and baseball are like intertwined at the hip, right? Like it's almost impossible to separate the two. Right. And so when I was coaching, I would be like, okay, when I am coaching, I'll allow myself to chew. I never chewed as a player because it, it's still messed with how you feel a little bit. But as a coach, I was like, man, I gotta lower my blood pressure. So I'm going to do something. And so I would do it when I was coaching, but not outside. And the moment I stopped coaching, I was like, I'm done, which is not something that typically happens with people, right? That's how you get, you know, lifelong tobacco addicts. Right. And so I knew that I was going to be okay with just being able to separate. Um, and so as far as that, the cravings for carbs, no, but it does give you a little bit of that. I want more, right? Like, so I eat some grapes and I'm like, I want some more grapes. Like, I don't want to just stop there. And so you have to fight that. And that's why people will be like, why don't you just introduce a few carbs? I'm like, cause then I literally just have to fight myself yeah. wanting to eat more than the, like, what is 50 grams going to do? Like what, you know, that's barely, it's, you know, it's like two bananas. Okay. What, what is that actually going to do for me during the day? And then I just spend the whole time going, well, I really want more, but I, I'm not going to. So it's easier just to not do it at all. Right. Yeah, I agree. I am someone with an extremely addictive personality. I'm someone that I have to abstain from the carbohydrates. In fact, uh, I'm living with my girlfriend right now, and she's transitioning towards a strict carnivore state, but it's one of those things where she's – it's a slow process for her. So she has other carnivore foods but also some sweeteners to help her get into that state. I know I, I don't – I am not averse to using sweeteners as a tool, as long as they're, you know, not like aspartame. I've never touched that. But um, she's like those Zevia drinks, right? Now, since they're in the fridge, though, I will encounter them. And then I will want to have a drink. But just like you said, it's like, okay, well, now I want more. And also, not only do I want more of the Zevia, I want to eat now. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even wanted to eat. And so... We understand how that can be a dangerous path, <laughs> even if you introduce just a few. I mean, that was one sip that we're talking about, and that's something that didn't even have carbs in it. Replace that stevia with just, you know, let's say it was a Coca-Cola. Still, one sip would have caused me to be like, okay, well now, appetite stimulated. I want more. Um, I am the person with that addictive personality, though. So I have to, you know, we got to put that stuff in a lockbox or something. But, you know... Um, so here's here's another thing that I want to ask you. So a lot of people talk about, okay, well, what's your experience? Or they ask about what's your experience on carnivore dietarily? You know, um, what is it like socially? So how do you have, do you have issues with like 
hanging out with friends or something or in social settings, given your dietary restrictions uh, that you have imposed onto yourself or even with your family, within your family or anything? Uh, so that's, that's where my past experience makes this super easy for me. Um, doing bodybuilding in my 20s, that's just your life, right? Like you carry around Tupperware, you bring food to parties, right. you, you, know, you don't eat at the restaurant and you just get used to it, right? You get used to just being that person that's not eating. And so that's natural for me. Um, I have no problem if I'm going to a barbecue, eating before I go to the barbecue and just not eating. And people think that bothers other people. For the most part, it doesn't. They don't even notice. They don't like 95% of the time, other people have no idea what it is you are not doing. And it's just your own perception. And so for me, that's fine. Um, most people know that I'm carnivore. And so then they just assume, you know, they might offer me a drink and I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. And they're like, okay. So it's what you make of it. Um, if you make it a big deal, other people will make it a big deal. Right. Uh, and, and you might get people, especially family members who, you know, kind of poke and prod you. But after a while, when you have these results and your family members don't, it becomes pretty easy. It's like, okay, well, why do you think I look the way I do and you look the way you do? Yeah. Right. It, it's just simple things. Like we, we do this in every aspect. Like you go to a bar and you're the one that has to drive. You just don't drink. Or if you drink, it's like an extremely small amount. And that's just a decision you have to make because you're an adult. It's no different going to a barbecue, right? Like it's cool. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to have fun. I don't need to eat in order to have fun. I ate prior, so I'm not hungry. And I'm just going to enjoy. And if other people have a problem with it, that says more about them than it does about me. Right. Yeah, I'm glad that you touched on the whole poking and prodding thing because that was actually going to be my next little sub-question there. Like how much peer pressure do you get? Uh, because... You know, that's another thing that I've heard that people deal with. They get the, it, it's almost, once you wake up to things like carb addiction, which most people don't think of as an addiction, they think of it as an, a, a more so a requirement dietarily, like you need carbs. So they don't think of it as an addiction. It's more of a just natural appetite thing. So whenever you abstain from it, they're more inclined to actually peer pressure you because they're not, they're not realizing it's a drug, but then you wake up to it and it feels a little, it's like, whoa, okay, you're, you're coming on too strong here. Like... But a lot of people deal with that peer pressure as a result. So I'm glad that you, you touched on that too. So Yeah, and the, the peer pressure thing is, uh, again, that's like a, you know, you got to deal with that throughout your entire life. Um, yeah. You know, in high school, it's drugs. In, you know, in college, it's alcohol. Like all of this stuff. And at some point, you just have to be comfortable with, you know, making your decision. And if people don't want to respect that, then, well, that's up to them. You know, it can be a lot different when it's family. Um that's a little bit different for me because my family is used to this, right? They're used to me being restrictive. They're used to me being, you know, the bodybuilding diet where I'm like, okay, cool. I'm glad you guys made family dinner. I, I can't eat it. Or, you know, it's Thanksgiving and I'm like, yeah, I, I can't eat that. Like, so that's normal for them. Um, so I, I have a little, I have that a little bit easier than an average person, but that, that's definitely a consideration. But that should not be the reason that you don't do something because you're afraid that your family's not going to support it, right? Like that's... Yeah. At some point, people need to be like, okay, my family should be supportive because they're my family and I'm doing this for ABC. And if you need to have that conversation, have the conversation. And if you just need to let them be upset about it, let them be upset. But at some point, you got to do what's best for you. And what, what's that quote? People are going to get upset the moment you start doing the things that are best for you. Yep. It just is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's very similar to... The uh, there's this little graphic that I see online a lot where it's like uh, no one said anything to me whenever I was eating this, yeah, and and then as soon as I start eating red meat, I'm gonna kill myself, right? Like, you know. So my next question that I have for you is, what made you decide to take all of this to social media in the first place? To be sort of a, it's I don't know if influencer is the right word. You, you, I mean, it's sort of basically that's like the the profession that's the official name for people right. that post on on social media. So what made you actually decide to take it to social media? Uh, when I realized that the, the very first one was realizing that there were not a lot of, at least at the time, I did not see a lot of younger in shape people on carnivore. Um, mm -hmm. and that's for anybody who's on carnivore. That's, I'm not saying there isn't, I did not see very many of them. And when I did get on, uh, you know, Twitter, especially 
So I, I basically started it and I was like, you know, I have really good results. I'm just going to like post some stuff about carnivore. I'm going to stay like a faceless account. I was like, I'll work on some video editing skills and mash some stuff up. And then as I started getting in the community, I realized there was this whole group of people that would be like, ah, it's just an elimination diet for a bunch of people who are really sick. That's all it is. And I'm like, well, that's not exactly true. And so I decided to post my, my first transformation and then that kind of got it rolling. Um, but honestly, so you, you say you've only seen me the last couple months. That's because I had, I don't know what I did, but Instagram, <laughs> they cut all of my content, like my reach and all my stuff for so long. Like I've had my account for started February of last year. Mm-hmm. So over a year. And for the longest time, Instagram was just like, nah, people aren't going to see your stuff. And so I started getting a following on Twitter. Um, a lot of it was food stuff. Um, I started posting different food reels, recipes, variations that people could do while still saying, for the most part, carnivore. And then it just kind of evolved. Like, I didn't really know I was going to end up kind of producing this kind of content. Uh, it just, as stuff happened and as I stopped trying to be a nice, well-mannered, happy, mm-hmm. positive person online. Uh, it just kind of turned into this. And then as the as the following started to grow, I realized there was a lot of people that just didn't know basic information or didn't know how to access basic, basic information. Um, as we talked on on my show, the the studies, right? Like and and I get it, right? You you Google a study, it takes you to an abstract. The abstract sounds like it's you know, a slam dunk. And then you open it up and you're like, what, is, how did they get this conclusion, conclusion out of this information? Like that's, I don't even have to be smart to know this. Like they literally say that in the paper, mm-hmm. but then they come to this conclusion. And so that's, that was the majority of the stuff I just started posting and people liked it. And so here I am. And yeah, my wife will be like, what do I call you? Like, what do I tell people you do? And I'm like, I don't know. She's like, I'm going to say influencer. I was like, I guess. I, I don't that, know what else to say. <laughs> like, yeah, that's the, that's the word. I mean, that even I uh, I recently was, I featured on Sean Baker's podcast, and I called myself an influencer at the beginning because he asked me what I what I do. And I was, it was like I was on the spot. I had to be extremely extemporaneous and be like, what do I call myself? And I, I said influencer. I know that's one person in particular in that comment section got a little, they, they pushed back a little bit. Uh, they were like, oh, dear, an influencer? But, you know, but I mean, that's really, that's what we're called. So well, until we find a better word, I'm going to be using that. But yeah, no, yeah. You're, you're, I think you're right. I, most people in the, in the carnivore space, when you look at people that are posting content, it's a lot of weight loss stuff, so, which is good. It's good. Um, that's what conferred the name weight loss diet upon it, even though that's not exactly what it is. That's a side effect. Um, but there are yes there are some people that are also you know very they they got very in shape afterwards but they're not the biggest influencers in the space because they're not trying to be influencers they're they're anecdotes on the site so i understand your desire to to do that and change that and um another key point that i wanted to focus on on there is that you just said that um once you stopped being a well-mannered person online then your your fame kicked up and that's something i keep trying to tell people um, because you're going to get pushback no matter what. Um, you get pushback if you're too anodyne and, inoffens- and inoffensive. And then you get pushback if you're extremely offensive online. I- I'm in the business of being offensive online. That's what I do. But it's because it garners an audience. <laughs> yeah. So there's proof right there, everyone, right there. Uh, but I mean, like, you just got to look at my T-shirt. Like, Yep. And that's, that, that's kind of where I landed. Like, I started and I was super, like, non-controversial. And then I came up with eat an effing steak and I would say that in my videos and some people would be like, oh, why the cussing? Yeah, right. I'm like, well, because yeah. it proves a point. And so then I've, I've kind of transitioned to where if I'm going to say that or have that kind of message, it's usually going to be printed on a shirt. Um, and I, I try to avoid swearing most of the time just because it. most of my reaction videos are to people who do like to swear a lot and it's a, a nice contrast. But yeah, right. as soon as you like become your more authentic self and some people think it, I'm doing this to to boost engagement. This is literally just who I am. Like I'm a low key sometimes. Like it is what it is. I'm just being me. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I tell people that, you know, my, my channel, and I'm sure you've seen my, you're, I, I think you're a public subscriber on my channel, so I don't know how much mm -hmm. you've watched, but I'm, it's not completely fabricated, but it's also, basically what it is, is what I tell people is, it's a part of me that is, that is isolated and concentrated, and then inflated for the channel. That's basically what it is. It's not like it's not me, but it's also in a way, it's far more brazen and brash than I actually would be when talking to people, but... That's kind of what you got to do. It's like politics in a way. It's just casting aspersions or whatever, but it's trying to get a point across exactly what you said. So well, that's that's what I did with this. What I eat in a day. I rarely post what I eat in a day, right? Like, I mean, I, for all the experiments, I posted what I ate every day. But I very much am not a hey, this is what I eat, and you're like, cool. I've seen that six thousand times. Right. Yeah. So I, I posted it, and it. I was like, all right, like, I'm gonna have no shame with this. I'm gonna bring up the wooden cutting board. I'm gonna put it all in a wooden cutting board. I'm going to have buzzwords like organic and pasture raised. I'm going to have raw cheese. I'm going to have, you know, raw milk and all this. And I was like, you know what? I'm not even mad about it because it's going to get people saying it looks like an exorbitant amount of food. So all these people are going to ask me if that's what I eat like in one meal or if that's spread out or no, and sure enough, they're that's not gonna exactly ask, what happened. They're not going to ask. They're going to, they're going to tell you that it's not and that you're lying. That's, that's, that's a big part yeah. of it. You're, you're a liar. <laughs> yeah so all of this stuff and i was like i know this is gonna happen and then you know i'm gonna post this weight loss and i'm gonna let people you know ask whether that was over two years or how long and yeah it's it a bit for engagement sure but there's also a bunch of people that genuinely want to know They're like wait a minute what exactly do you eat I'm like, well this is pretty much it right so you know do you have to play the game sometimes absolutely uh but just don't play the game at the expense of like the type of person you are. I'm more, yeah, I'm more surprised at how many people still fall into the trap. The amount of commenters that fall into that trap. It's amazing. It's like, it's, it'll never end, but yeah, you just, just dangle it. And sure enough, here it comes. It's the carbs. Every time I post something that you don't need carbs, hundreds of people uh -huh. just flood. Yep. So, I asked you what the feedback from your family and friends has been really on the diet, I think. Maybe not explicitly that. It was how they handled it. Um, what, actually, let me yeah, let me ask again. Have they said anything about it? Like, Have they expressed their ideas about it, even if they are still okay with you doing it or haven't really objected to you know, vehemently about it? Have they expressed their opinions on it at all? Uh, it's almost all been positive. Um, okay. My little brother tried it for a little while uh, before I actually knew he was trying it. Uh, my parents have like tried to integrate some stuff into it. Uh, same with my wife. And then a bunch of people that like my wife works with or, you know, random friends. They're like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do this. And so it's been a lot more positive than I honestly would have thought. Um, and almost everybody is like, dude, I feel better. I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> Amazing. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's actually contrary to social media it's i think it's actually mostly positive in real life like real life people understand yeah. that you can't just go off especially post pandemic right like people are less likely to take a publication or a you know authoritative scientist or, or doctor figure what they say at face value and so they, they start to look into it a little bit more and they start to understand that yeah maybe this actually might like it seems pretty reasonable that something we've been doing for a very long time would be an acceptable way to eat now um and you know some people might not like the extreme restriction or they might have the wrong idea wait are you saying you only eat meat and nothing else ever like no that's not what i'm saying oh well what oh that's not that bad um that seems to be my typical one is the people who have this idea that carnivore is the lion diet I'm like no it doesn't have to be like right. you can yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, and then it's the people who are like, wait a minute, you can never eat. No, I can eat whatever I want. Like I literally, I can eat whatever I want. It's just, I choose to stick to this type of eating for the most part. And that's about it. And then what, once people get their head around the fact that it's not, it's not a cult, like it's not veganism, you know, it's not something that in the next 12 years, I can never touch a vegetable ever again. I just choose not to. Oh, that, that's good. I've had the very, I've had a very similar experience. The only thing that ever happened was whenever I first told my mom about it. Uh, I remember her doing the dishes, and I told her what I was doing, 
And she said, that can't be healthy. And I said, yeah, I thought so too. But then the more I talked to her about it, she came around. Uh, it's like she listens to what I say and she goes, oh, like she doesn't immediately, she doesn't put me down and be like, no, that's not true. Um, so I've, I've had very similar experiences. My dad does the same thing. Uh, he's more of what you would call dirty carnivore, I would say. Um, it's, he, he mainly focuses on the absence of carbs more than the absence and and, ke and keeping heavy meat based than the absence of spices and certain vegetables or whatever, like onions and mushrooms. You, many people are like that. That's what we call ketovore in the space. Um, but it's almost like bordering on the line of carnivore and ketovore. It's, it's, it's odd, but many of my family members they they do at, at the very least trust what i have to say or or at the very least they don't completely they're not completely opposed uh and vehemently just no we're that's ridiculous so i've had similar experiences it's a totally different world outside of social media on social media it'll make you think totally different about that but <laughs> well it also gives you this false sense that everybody knows something about nutrition because on social media everybody pretends like they know something about nutrition uh -huh. And then you talk to a real life person and they're like, what's a carb? I don't know what that is. Yeah. Right. It's, it's the, what is that? Mean girls, the movie. Uh, do you like, do you eat carbs? I don't know. Is butter a carb? Yeah. yeah. Then yes. <laughs> You're like, that's the average person in real life. Like mm -hmm. the average person in real life is not what you see on social media. Right. Well, yeah. So speaking of social media, um, I know the answer to this question, but for anyone that doesn't know who you are. Uh, how has the general public been receiving your message uh, about carnivore and, and the diet and everything like that? For the most part, good. Um, okay. Yeah, like it's been a lot less. I finally kicked the vegans on Twitter. I had a, I had quite a large uh, troll following on on Twitter, and then after I just stopped engaging them, they kind of disappeared. Uh, but for the most part, the, the responses are super positive. Um, I still get the people who, you know, follow around, especially the calorie ones. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I get a decent amount of those, which is fine. Like, those are the people I pick fights with, right? Like, it's my t-shirt, right? Uh, but by and large, like, it's super positive, um, especially once you start getting into the community. And I think that's the cool thing about carnivore and why so many people think that it's a cult uh, because people get super excited and in real life there's not a ton of people right like the chances of you ever meeting another person that does carnivore in real life is pretty low yeah so you want to find people on social media and how do you find people on social media you make social media profiles that tell everybody you're carnivore so everybody can kind of find each other um it's just i mean it's what it is like everybody wants support in what they're doing and so yeah, I think it's awesome. Um, I think the community is awesome. There's obviously some dogmatic people within it, which is yeah, fine. Absolutely. That's human nature. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, you have your people who, you know, they spend their entire life trying to bash carnivore for no reason. Um, and outside of that, you have the average person who's like, yeah, I like meat. I don't know if I would do that completely. But yeah, whatever. Do whatever you want. Um, and I think that's that's the vast majority of people. They don't care. Like, just don't cram it down their throats, and they honestly don't really care that much. Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, that actually is a good segue, too, because you were talking about picking fights with vegans. It's it's usually the other way around, really. They try they pick fights with you. That's that's what it's good. But, of course, you know, posting the inflammatory content, you could say that that's instigating a little bit. But um, how much of the carnivore movement do you think is – because I've heard this argument before. How much of it do you think is – a retaliatory movement, just the complete, it's the retaliation to veganism, just the other extreme, right? Uh, versus actually rooted in the most, you know, scrupulous kind of responsible and disciplined interpretation or interpretations of science. I honestly don't think 99% of vegans or uh, carnivores care about vegan. Like, honestly, if, if you took the the moral belief out of veganism, no carnivore would ever care. They literally wouldn't care. Um, it's not the diet that anybody has a problem with. It's no. the, you know, the cult like mentality. And for anybody who wants to argue, veganism is a cult. I don't care what you say. It's, yeah. it's the belief that what we are doing is wrong strictly by eating meat. 
Mm-hmm. And obviously carnivores, the, you know, they have a problem with everybody that eats meat, but carnivores, the, you know, as far opposite as you can. So we're the easy target. Um, but most, most issues that carnivores have with vegan is the fact that after a while, it kind of wears on you to be told that you're a murderer and a bad person and an abuser. And I wouldn't let you around my kids and I hope you die. And yep. what if we treated you the same way? And even the person that doesn't care what other people say eventually that's probably going to get to you at least a little bit. Um, so I, I honestly think that's the only thing. Um, and so then the response is sometimes go overboard. Well, I'm going to eat five steaks, right? It's the the Alex um, Jones meme mm-hmm. where he's like holding a huge platter of, of meat. And he's like, I'm going to eat twice as much steak so that a vegan's not accomplishing anything by not eating meat, yep. right? Like, so you get that stuff. But I think if you were to take out the the fact that veganism is a belief system, view it just as a diet. I don't think carnivore has anything to do with veganism whatsoever. Right, yeah, I agree. I, me and Sean Baker and I talked about this at the end. Um, he asked me if I had been, if I'd felt during my upbringing that I was sort of propagandized by the vegan movement um, at all. And I didn't really feel like that, but what I told him was I never realized how dystopian it actually was until I started getting into this space. Um, not only are these people claiming that plants are good for you or even like like more so than meat, they're actually, in order to try and convince people to adopt their ideology, which is just like you said, it, it's a cultic religion. That is what it is. It is predicated on, on, upon a moral, moral doctrine that not only equates animal lives to human lives, but actually venerates them more uh, because it is, it is anti-human. They don't care if they kill themselves with their diet as long as another animal gets to live, just so that they can get ripped apart by another animal, might I add. But, you know, that's just <laughs> for another day. Um, basically, I said it's dystopian because not only, once again, are they trying to get people to believe it's healthier— they're saying that you're a bad person if you eat meat. They're, they're trying to guilt trip people into eating only plants and not eating any animal products. And of course, there's lies within, within that sphere as well, like how animal... First of all, the inappropriate extrapolation of certain methods of slaughter for animals to every single one and to every person that eats meat as if they support those uh, methods necessarily, which is just ridiculous on its face. But... um. Yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. That carnivores are not the retaliatory movement. There's it's it's underpinned by science first of all, um, and not a moral doctrine or something. But also, not only is it predicated upon science, we don't care if you want to eat plants. It has nothing to do with you eating plants. The issue is with. What you just said, the the cat, the the vituperation of other people uh, as if they're as if they're horrible people for eating meat, and this animosity that we receive, um, that in many cases can actually in, in public even you see these clips where it's, they they will actually threaten you and and yell at you like it's just ridiculous. But anyway, I could spend all day talking about that. Um, we did mention the ethical argument though uh, that they that they put forth, so I wanted to actually get your opinion on if you sympathize at least a little bit with their argument, the, the vegan argument, and if you do what you believe the actual solution to this whole issue can be, the whole like animal cruelty thing, and, st- and besides shifting to only plants because it's that's not indicated and, and carnivore seems to be the most indicated diet for human beings across the board, species appropriate, right? Um, what would your... That's the second part of the question is what would your solution be rather than the whole go vegan thing? So I almost always end this argument before it even starts with a, and I argue about this with anything, whether it's politics or religion or vegan, carnal, like whatever it is. If we can agree that in a perfect circumstance, it is okay for me to kill an animal to eat it, then we can now talk about the in-between but none of them will ever get there. They're like, no, I want to talk about factory farming. I'm like, well, it doesn't matter because in a perfect world, if I raised it, let this cow sleep in my bed, right? Ferdinand, like the the Disney movie. If I treated this animal like that 
and then at the end killed it without any pain or stress and then ate it, would that be okay? And nobody will agree to that. I'm like, okay, so what's the point? What's the point of talking about the in-between? Because you don't right. think in a perfect world that it's okay. Now, does that mean our, per- our system is currently good? No. Um, honestly, that's a good question. Like the, the easy one is to get all of our food from grass-fed regenerative farming. And, you know, that's, that's a perfect world. Is that plausible for a country of 340 million people? No. So what's the in-between? Uh, the in-between is getting rid of the monopoly we have on food. Like mm-hmm. That's the first start. Like you're, you're never going to get anywhere if you know three or four major companies, all government-backed, own the supply of beef. It's just not going to happen. So once you take that from you know this conglomerate monopoly of, of food production and get it back to local then you could you you could have larger farms that are grain fed and and you know grass fed and grain finished that are cheaper you know that are fattier that produce more meat but are still in a lot better conditions than this factory farming and you know the worst ones are like chicken right mm-hmm. um you know, those are terrible. Pigs are terrible. But a lot of that is based on what the government allows, mm-hmm. right? Like pigs are allowed. You can feed a pig garbage as long as you heat it to a certain temperature. Yep. What? Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Excuse me? Like, what are we talking about here? So that's the first one. Like, just, you know, it's the same thing with the government should not have control over our food supply. Um, that's the worst idea in the history of ideas. So without that, nothing's ever going to change. Um, now, how people can affect that is trying to buy local as much as possible, mm-hmm. which is tough. I get it because now you're paying three, four, or five times extra to do that because these these farmers have very low profit margins, right? Like it's, you know, they have to raise this cow for 18, 24 months, hope to get 600 pounds out of it, and then hope they can do that, you know, 100 times in order to make a little bit of money. Yeah. So... It, it, honestly, you have to blow up the entire system um, to make it better for animals. But I, I think it all starts with trying to go local because go to a local farm. Like anybody who's ever grown up, I grew up with cows. Like that was literally how we lived. You know, that wasn't our only source of food, but we would buy a calf, raise the calf, slaughter the cow, stick it in the freezer, do it again. That's not bad for the animal. Like those animals are treated well. And, you know, people say, oh, they die. Like, animals die. That's just that's what they do. Exactly. <laughs> like, compare, they die in the wild so other animals can eat. Compare you compare the way that we, that farmers kill their animals to the way in which a cow is ripped apart by wolves in in the wild. I, I, I follow this. I don't, I don't know if you, you follow the page Nature is Metal on Instagram or if you've ever seen it. All mm-hmm. they do is post, like, videos of what happens in nature, like, like, uh, I, I have seen a bunch of those sensational yeah. things, and a lot of them are predatory animals uh, killing, you know, their prey. Now I know that there's a, a large demographic of that following that just follows it because it's they're sadistic in a way. I know it because you see they say it in the comments. They're like, "Whoa, that's," a, and I'm like, "Well, that's not why I follow the page." I actually purposely follow that page to constantly remind myself of what happens since we're so detached, since we're domesticated as human beings ourselves, to remind ourselves or to remind myself of what actually happens out in, in the wild like that. And so if you, if you showed someone a video of that happening and you, and you compare it to the farmer killing their animal for food, not, not out of malicious intent. By the way, animals are doing the same thing. It's not out of malice. Uh, of course, the vegan movement is predicated upon only compassion for the, the, the prey, not the predator that would starve without having killed that animal. Also completely failing to mention that that prey is is predatory himself to another animal or itself to another animal in many cases. But anyway, um, it's just it's it's predicated upon upon nonsense. And if you just showed them that dichotomy, um, they'd either have to face the reality that their idea or their ideology is fallacious to, to at least a certain extent or they'll just deny it which is usually what happens they'll go no i don't want to talk about it. no 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 that's right and then come up with some sort of pseudo sophisticated desperate attempt at at you know 
bolstering their argument and, and re, uh, revitalizing it. But anyway, um, well, it, no, it's it's a true point that you know we've become so detached from where our food comes from. I yeah. on Twitter about probably about six months ago, I posted a news article of a middle school in Pennsylvania where they brought in a deer that a teacher had shot and they had a class on how to butcher it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm like, that is, so I, that was my experience at 12 years old, like 12 years old. I shot my first deer. My dad came home, like helped me hang it and, you know, disembowel it and skin it. And that's like, it's a sobering experience. Like, I don't know anybody who's like giddy happy about doing yeah, it. Yeah, no. But it, it's a sobering experience to understand where food comes from. And that, that's what it is. Like, that's how the world works. That's how it's always worked. And that's how it will always work. And if you want to become detached from that and think that it's not, well, I'm, I have news for you. Like, that's how every animal who has ever existed has gotten their food. They've eaten something else that was living. Whether it was a plant or a small rodent or a small animal or a big animal. That's just how they eat. And we do the same. And understanding that's powerful because you now understand, like you respect the animal and you respect where it comes from and you want to cause it as little harm as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's the people that have mental issues out there, but right. for the most part, your standard person is not going to look at a dying animal and get joy out of that. No, no that doesn't feel good to watch an animal die. But if you understand that that's where your food comes and you are now thankful, like go ask people are like farmers. How could you do that? Like, those are the most thankful people on earth. They are very thankful to this cow that that cow gave its life that they could eat. They make and, sure not to waste any of the animal. Yeah. Like they, they make sure to do that. Yeah, I want to be extra careful. I watched this animal die. I want to be extra careful to make sure that I process this properly so I don't have to waste any. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, and to, to shift over to the whole, the other part of what you were talking about, the food monopoly, basically, that we have today I did. I saw a tweet a few years ago, um, talking about this, and they said that, you know, a food shortage may not actually be a cataclysmic or catastrophic event. It may already be happening. The monopoly that we see, where it's like fewer and fewer people control the, the meat supply, for example, whether it be poultry or or beef, and the more food stuff that's on shelves that isn't food, that in and of itself you can consider a food shortage, because. You've got this monopoly on real food, uh, so only three people are in charge. Let's say I pull the number out of my ass. You know, it's it's it's, it's a small number. And then you've got all this other food on shelves that isn't food that's just keeping us sick. We already have a food shortage. We do. It's just not a catastrophic event like it was in the Great Depression or something. That's it's not the same thing. So I think that that's an, another important message. To, to get out to people. The most important way of fixing that is, like you said, buying local, but, you, you know, that's difficult. I just recently, we went to a farmer's market, and I came across a stand, and I picked up this guy's, uh, the, the log cabin ranch um, here in Illinois, and I, I saw his prices, and at first, I know people would look at that and just be, like, taken aback, but I knew immediately why they were as expensive as they were. I knew why. Uh, unfortunately, that has to be the case. In order to get around that, what you can do is... In an ideal world, everyone would have their own animals like we used to. So you were you were saying that it's not very it's not a very sustainable option. It's it's not practical to completely blow the whole system up, right? Um, and it's it would be if everyone over time it wouldn't be an instantaneous thing, but over time started to take control of this themselves, and we and then they they put power into their own hands basically, or they took control. And then they wouldn't have to depend on other people for food ever. It would only be in their hands. So that's another message. I wrote about that in in my book as well. Um, you know, plug? No, I'm just I'm just I'm just saying. Uh, it, it was in in chapter four. It was all about what the consequences of the industrial revolution were. The second one, the the technological mm -hmm. one, and one of them was the industrialization of our food supply. And that happened around the '60s with the with the different feeding of animals, and then and then over time they took control of over it. And that's a problem in and of itself. And I understand not thinking that originally, but we are now aware of the problems right there. So yes, to go all the way back to how this even started with the whole, with, with vegans claiming that sort of like you're necessarily in favor of the way animals are treated in the industrial um, sector because you eat meat and conventional meat, 
which in many cases people just can only buy that. They, they don't even have the money to buy anything else. Um, ridiculous. But also even their solution is ridiculous. Their, their solution that just eat plants. Well, well it's uh, then they'll go, you can't feed 8 billion people. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but I am not aware of any country on earth that is operating on how we're going to feed starving countries in Africa. Like, right. I get it. Like that's humanitarian. But at the end of the day, we still take care of our food supply. Like we should not make our food choices based on what can support an African com country. Like that that one. And then I love this one too. And they hate this argument. They're like you support animal abuse by eating meat. I'm like, cool. You support human slavery by typing this message on your cell phone because it <laughs> uses cobalt from a mine in Africa. And they're like, no, it's not the same thing. Yeah, it kind of is. It, yeah. If you want to get that like indirect with the consequences there, I mean, there, there you yeah. go. Cause it all leads to something else. But yeah, that is, that is another argument. Uh, it's very similar to what I just said, where, where the solution to this is not eating plants this, because if you just eat plants, I guess the, 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 their theory is that if everyone ate plants then that would cause the meat industry to lose a bunch of money because no one's buying the meat and then you can it will fall apart from there right except for the fact that also in order to make everyone vegan you have to make so much more monocrop farming which just which destroys animals habitats which would still kill them and in many cases uh you know a lot of times they'll be like well it's unintentional death no not always actually because we we kill quadrillions of insects with pesticides um have you ever, you know, in order to actually maintain crops, you have to sometimes intentionally kill animals that are eating your crops. So there's another problem. They are intentional deaths in many cases. So not all, so at least with the, with the meat industry, it's, it may sound backwards, but with veganism, you've got unintentional and intentional deaths. Well, at least in the meat industry, all the deaths are intentional and they know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's the feeding the world. The vegans will simply use they go, okay, well, this amount of land is used for raising animals. Mm. If we turn that into crops, we can feed the entire world. And then you go, do you know what the word arable means? Two-thirds of pasture land is non-arable, which means you cannot plant on it. So no, it doesn't work that mm. way. And they're like, yeah, but we can save the rainforest because they're cutting down rainforests for soy for animals. We could go all day on vegans. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the only last note that I would say is is the, the that solution has many problems, of course, but the solution that we offer is much more sustainable because if everyone had their own animals, first of all, an entire cattle kill can last you up to a year, depending on who you are, even a family in many cases, depending on how much they eat. And... Also, many more animals would flourish. There'd be far more. Like the, again, it, they would be living better lives because of the way that we would be slaughtering them compared to the way in which other animals would. Right, and not to say that that predator once again is is, is bad. They don't know what that. They just they're using their teeth because they have to. Right, um, and then finally the sustainability. Once again, we it was sustainable for four and a half million years when we were doing it. So the reason it's not sustainable now is because of what we have done. If we reverted it back to what we were doing where we were a carnivore, which is just – that's an un, a unambiguous fact at this point. That we, we were carnivores. We had 20% of our effective fuel intake come from fibrous tubers, which inferentially speaking we know were not eaten out of alacrity. It was not done out of desire. Um, there was another isotope study that was conducted that um, they showed that they were eating a lot of this flour. And immediately people were like, oh, plant-based, right? Well, whenever they looked at the actual specific flower that was uh, that was eaten, I can't remember what country this was done, and it was near the UK. It was identified to be an extremely poisonous flower. It would kill you upon like consumption if you'd eaten enough of it. So, again, inferentially speaking, these people were not eating it because they wanted to eat it. They were They were starving to death. There was no meat around there. I don't know the exact time period that the remains were uh, that the remains were from, because that's also important. That gives you context of what was happening back then. Like, was the megafauna dying off at that point already, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason it's not sustainable right now, 
when it was sustainable when we were eating carnivores is because of what we've done to our food supply and how much we've introduced monocrop agriculture and, and killed off a bunch of animals in order to do such a thing. And they don't like to acknowledge that because, well, it is a religious cult. Because that is what it is. As soon as something is built upon a moral doctrine like that, or a moral principle, they like to say it's scientific. It's not. In fact, many of them explicitly say it's, it's, it's not about health. It's about uh, a message and, and, and morality. And then in the same breath, they'll argue that it's healthier, but whatever. So, you know, it's not about health, but it's healthier and you guys are killing yourselves. Whatever. But okay. Yeah, you're right. We, we can talk about it for <laughs> for hours probably but um no nah, this was a good conversation i think i don't really talk about the ethics that much on my channel i my channel is usually a bunch of acrimonious rhetoric towards other people <laughs> um but i think it's important to get the message out there and uh i'll definitely be i'll make sure to get this out here as fast as possible um but i appreciate you for coming on the channel uh i know yeah, that absolutely. everyone's time is sensitive especially you've got kids and everything so um i uh look forward to talking to you in the future we'll definitely keep in touch for sure um as we all have to you know have to support each other in this tumultuous uh community here and and all that but um yeah we'll, we can schedule another talk at some other point um down the road and talk about okay. other things so yeah once again thanks for thanks for coming on and i perfect will, absolutely I will